Good I am the Maven of the Eventide and welcome to Vampire Reviews, where we talk about what the vampire means. There, there's nothing in here. The time has come for us to talk about the vampire, the statue. The book! <laughs> also, the actual vampire named Lestat. Though there is a whole lot more to Lestat than in this one book. A whole lot more. But we are going to take things one Lestat step at a time. This book is the second volume of 15 ish in the prolific author Anne Rice's internationally acclaimed best selling. Vampire Chronicles series, which began in 1976 and is still going 43 years later with the latest book coming out just a few months ago and hints of another on the way. And these are big, dense books for the most part, the bulk of them heavily researched and intrinsically detailed historical fiction spanning thousands of years. Book two. The Vampire Lestat came out in 1985, nine long years after the first Vampire Chronicle, which wasn't originally intended to be a series, it was just a standalone novel, but Lestat could not be contained. This novel is a direct follow-up to Interview with the Vampire. You know, the book that changed the landscape of vampire fiction in the most hugely significant way of any piece of vampire media ever since Dracula? Yeah, that book. But The Vampire Lestat is not exactly a sequel to Interview. The framing device at the very beginning and very end of the novel take place after Interview and indirect reaction to it, but the bulk of the book is much more of a prequel. It tells the life story of Lestat, the vampire, the vampire Lestat, who is a major secondary character in Interview. <laughs> secondary character, that didn't last long. Well, so it seems now there were those nine years between the two books before Lestat veritably took over the resultant series and became its hero, to use the author's word, and one of the most popular vampire characters in the world. Besides the movies everybody knows, there's also this really great graphic novel adaptation of The Vampire Lestat that came out in 1990. <sighs> what? If you didn't already know that Lestat is my favorite vampire of all time, you need to go back and rewatch the rest of my videos. All of them. When Anne Rice wrote Interview with the Vampire back in the 1970s, she actually had issues with getting it published because the industry at the time just didn't know where it fit or what to do with it. Yeah, the publishing industry is all about categories, putting things into boxes. Interview with the Vampire is artistic historical fiction. It's unquestionably literary, but it wasn't about Ordinary People, which was absolutely what was expected of serious fiction at the time. It was about the exceptional. It was about vampires, and that made it <gasps> genre fiction. And yet, it wasn't pulpy like what the industry was used to fitting in the derided sci-fi fantasy horror niches of the time. But much like how Mary Shelley didn't know she was inventing the science fiction genre when she wrote Frankenstein, nowadays, four decades after it was written, Interview with the Vampire is considered a genre-launching modern literary classic and is treated with respect by many institutions of higher learning that even still turn up their noses at most other speculative fiction. As well it should be. It's entirely thanks to authors like Anne Rice and her contemporary Chelsea Quinn Yarborough that the modern urban fantasy genre exists, even though as literary as it is, this book wouldn't fit at all now in what that genre has become. Despite the reverence that Interview with the Vampire has earned, the rest of the Vampire Chronicles are not held in such high regard by literary snobs. 
Even with the ground that's been broken in the name of speculative fiction's merits in recent years, the books are often dismissed as the author writing fan fiction of her own characters, which, think about what you're saying. There's a lot to unpack and discuss regarding the popular and critical reception to the Chronicles as they developed over the decades and the way that the characters and lore progressed. But that is a discussion for another night. And back in 1985, when this book emerged on the scene, it was quite the phenomenon. People loved the stat. In an interview with the vampire, he's framed as something of an antagonist, even villainous, by the unreliable and heavily biased vampire narrator Louis. But even as a villain, he was awesome, complex, sympathetic, and possessed of a wonderfully vibrant, magnetic, charming personality, serving as a darkly lovable foil to the super angsty emo Louis by living his vampire life with this unapologetic joie de vivre. Anne Rice says that back when she wrote Interview with a Vampire, Lestat's character was initially inspired by her husband, the poet Stan Rice. His name was actually originally supposed to be Lestan, before she changed that last N to a T. But as the Chronicles developed, she says Lestat became an extension of herself instead. She describes him as this side of her that she wished she was bold enough to express, a specifically masculine male side that as someone who was assigned female at birth, she was always discouraged from exploring. She's often expressed in public statements a dismissal of the gender binary, and though she calls herself a woman, she says that she has no clear gender identity. Also, almost all of the vampires in the Chronicles are bi and they fall in love with people of all genders. And this has been a huge deal for queer readers over the past 40 years. I attended the New York City release event for this book when it came out in 2014, which included a Q&A with the author. And so many people of all ages stood up to tell her in front of the audience of hundreds how her vampires had served as their queer awakening or gave them the courage to come out of the closet. Especially back in the 1980s for the older speakers, and especially Lestat. Before the Babadook, Lestat was our horror queer icon. The premise of this book is that it is an autobiography that Lestat writes in reaction to reading Interview with the Vampire, which is a real book that was published in his world. Lestat's been in a catatonic vampire sleep underground for a few decades, and when he wakes up in 1985, he finds out that his ex-life partner, Louis, has had this book, Interview with the Vampire, published. And Lestat is pissed off. Not because Louis has spilled all sorts of taboo vampire secrets to the public, Lestat actually thinks that part is pretty cool, but because Louis made him look like such a shallow asshole in his story. Bitch. So Lestat writes his own life story to show the world that he's actually really complex and deep and sympathetic and misunderstood. Just kidding. Well, sort of. He actually doesn't care that much what other people think of him. He's too cool for that. What he really wants to do is spill mysterious forbidden vampire secrets of his own as a way to combat his existential angst. As he reveals, he's been keeping some pretty huge secrets about the origins of vampires and the full extent of vampiric powers since he was made back in the 1780s. And he is done living in secrecy and solitude and loneliness apart from humanity. So he's going to share these secrets with the world and either change the whole world or be destroyed as a result. The thought of either outcome excites him after 200 years of loneliness. So in this book, he writes, we learn the whole story of who he was as a human, how he became a vampire, and all the adventures he had in the first 10 years of his vampiredom, meeting elder vampires who share their ancient secrets with him. Because he's just so lovable, they gotta share with him. The autobiography only covers the first 
10 years, because after that is when he met Louis and the rest is already written in Interview with the Vampire. Despite Lestat's grumpiness with the way Louis told the story of their life together with their little vampire daughter Claudia, he doesn't have much to add to Louis's story other than to insist that Louis was way more romantically interested in Lestat than he lets on in Interview, and to own the mistake of creating Claudia, and say that he deserved all the pain and suffering he endured as a result, but he still doesn't regret it. And that's pretty much Lestat's whole MO. No regrets. Therefore, besides writing this book that's going to get him in serious trouble with all the other vampires in the world, he also decides to become a rock superstar in the 80s heavy metal hairband vein, and writes a bunch of songs and MTV music videos, you know, back when MTV actually used to play music videos, telling the secrets that blast him to most famous person in the world status for like a week, culminating in a live concert with an audience of 15,000 people where he invites all the vampires in the world to come and get him. Lestat doesn't do anything small. And the book ends on a super cliffhanger where the most dangerous vampire in existence actually does come and get him. Seriously, you're reading this and you're like, what? That's it. And it was three years before the next book came out. Imagine the suspense. But the rock star stuff is just the framing device. The bulk of the book is young Lestat in pre-revolutionary France trying to figure out how to exist in the world as a newly born murderous monster of the night. And this is complicated for him because he's wanted nothing more in his life than to be good. But what is goodness? That's actually the book summed up in three words. It's pretty much 550 pages of philosophical contemplation and debate on the nature of good and evil. Lestat is an optimist with an air of innocence about him in that he steadfastly believes goodness exists and is achievable. Even for an inherently evil vampire, he holds on to that belief with a tenacity that is virtually unshakable. His philosophies are contrasted by four main supporting characters. His cynical emo human boyfriend, Nikki, his distant self-absorbed mother, Gabrielle, both of whom he turns into vampires, as well as two older vampires, the 300-year-old brainwashed Satan worshiper, Armand, and the 2,000-year-old enlightened sage Marius. They all have different points of view on good and evil based on their ages and religious inclinations. Lestat describes himself as godless and being born of a time period when God was dead, the progressivism of the French Enlightenment. This is a huge contrast as well to the romanticism of Louis' highly Catholic Americanized philosophies in Interview with the Vampire. Anne Rice says that when she writes, she gets so entirely inside the story she's telling that she's totally unaware of any allegorical or personal meaning. I fear analysis, she says. I am with the characters. I don't want analysis. I want immersion. She says her fundamental belief is the origin of art, including fiction writing, is psychological. It comes from this deep root in the individual mind of the writer who struggles to achieve what feels authentic. Not any intention to produce allegories or metaphors. Though, like many authors, she then looks at her writing after the fact and realizes meaning has emerged from the authenticity. The allegories and metaphors are woven out of the subconscious and, of course, interpreted by audience reception. The most important thing. What simply feels natural and goes without saying to an author can end up having deep significance for a reader. For example, the whole having a collection of characters that fall in love with anyone regardless of gender thing? Anne Rice has even said that she only realized after it was written that Interview with the Vampire was her subconsciously working through the grief of losing her young child and an expression of the complexities of her intensely Catholic upbringing 
despite how obviously it is all there on the page. So, when we look at the vampire Lestat with the knowledge of the author's public statements about her facilitations in regard to her Catholicism, her rejection of religion, her temporary return to it, and later distance again over the decades since it was written, it seems obvious now that the vampire allegory in this book deals with the loss of religion. And for a character truly godless, what is the reason for existence? How does one create meaning in life? And is such a thing right? Does rightness even exist? And how is it connected to goodness? And how does that change upon becoming a vampire? Need it change? This book is exceedingly secular, especially compared to Interview with the Vampire. Lestat is a vampire born of an age of reason and science. And unlike Louis the Miserable Romantic, Lestat's brain is concerned with logic and analysis. And to dismiss God and religion from a philosophical debate of good and evil with regards to literally supernatural magical creatures set in an emerging age of reason and practicality presents a wonderful paradox. Lestat never claims his views on goodness must be correct, but he is incapable of believing otherwise. To him, goodness is a kind of honesty, personal truth, authenticity of the individual, shamelessness, a dismissal of quality restrictions or pretension. He often compares himself, born an impoverished aristocrat, to the wealthy bourgeois, who possess all the material comforts he lacks, but still desperately desire something as meaningless as a title of nobility. So pretentious, so inauthentic. When Lestat awakens in the 1980s from his 50-year nap, he is delighted that the America he emerges into has returned to a godless era of indulgence and freedom after spending such a long time in puritanical repression. Superstition is as dead again as it was in the era of the French Enlightenment philosophers of his youth, and Lestat is eager to rejoin society. He just needs to figure out where and how he can fit into it, you know, considering he's a murderous, blood-drinking creature of the night and all. The book discusses often how vampires need to assign meaning and purpose to their immortality, otherwise they will go mad and destroy themselves. For vampires like Armand and his satanic cult, the Children of Darkness, this meaning is a belief that the vampire's place in religion is to serve as the evil as conceived by God in order to give goodness meaning. The evil must exist so that the good may fight it. Lestat thinks this is stupid, but he also does consider himself a form of evil. He kills and eats people after all, but he realizes that pure evil has no place in the modern era of the 1980s, which means he has no place. The vampire has no place other than as an artistic metaphor in things like rock music that show how they refuse to accept evil exists through dramatizations. So therefore, there's really nothing else to do with himself than become the living embodiment of an artistic metaphor. And a rock star. Hey, it's either that or dissolve into the abyss of existential meaninglessness. Might as well go out with a bang. Or who knows, maybe he'll change the whole world. Yeah, uh, spoilers for the rest of the series? He doesn't. His brazen actions have a huge impact on vampire society, but humanity and the rest of the world around them goes on in willful blindness to the supernatural, as it always has. When he first becomes a vampire, Lestat tries to only kill evildoers because, you know, he's a good guy. But eventually, he has this epiphany that this is a delusion of his nature. Turns out, he is equally capable of killing the innocent. And to pretend that he has any place as some kind of righteous force of judgment against evildoers is ridiculous self-deception. False nobility. No better than the bourgeois pretense he so often derides. In order to live up to his own idea of goodness, he must accept 
is evil. But is it truly evil to kill innocent people if that is part of your nature? The circle of life? Lestat grows to see the world as what he calls a savage garden, a wilderness where morality is a social delusion, just as it means nothing to the plants and beasts of nature who destroy one another to survive. The only true meaning he can accept has to do with the aesthetic. A thousand other things can be said about the world, he says, but only aesthetic principles can be verified. And if there is one thing that links all the Vampire Chronicles together, no matter how they go back and forth on religious or moral stances, it's aesthetic. Whether it's your cup of blood or not, these books have a style that, if I had to sum up in one word, I'd call it luscious. Lestat's mother Gabrielle is on board with this savage aesthetic philosophy, though she takes it to a further extreme, preferring a truly wild existence among nature. As a human woman in the 1700s, she was trapped by patriarchal societal constraints of gender and decorum. As a vampire, she not only sheds her femininity, taking on the guise of a man, but ends up rejecting society altogether. For her, the vampire is liberation, freedom from oppression. Lestat, meanwhile, is too in love with humanity to live apart from it. And this connection to it gives him reason to exist. Stimulation. Excitement. Instead of existing as a nightmare graveyard wraith like the vampires of legend, he styles himself as a gentleman death in silk and lace. A new evil, fit for a new godless world, divorced of religious meaning, the vampire as the most human of monsters, and therefore the most terrifying because of how it reflects humanity and our own capacity for monstrousness. At the end of Lestat's ten years of seeking answers and then learning the origin of vampires amounts to little more than a freak accident and accepting the meaninglessness, the wise sage mentor vampire figure of Marius swears Lestat to secrecy and advises him to live out one lifetime as if he were mortal. This will supposedly keep Lestat from going mad with existential angst, and this is why he moves to America and shacks up with Louis and Claudia for 65 years. Until it all ends horribly, and Lestat disconnects from society for a while before he goes underground to sleep. In the years between when he loses his family and he takes his long nap, he does go a bit mad, the narration artistically becoming disjointed and confused. But even at his lowest point, Lestat still clings to a sense of meaning about his existence. He vows to endure as a continual awareness in the world, not for any purpose at all, but just so that an awareness exists, because after all, what is aesthetic if there's nothing or no one to be aware of it? It's bleak, but it's something. And then he gets over it and becomes a rock star. Over the years and books that follow this one, Lestat changes a lot in some ways. He finds religion, then loses it again alongside the author's personal religious journey. There are even a couple books in the series now that Anne Rice chooses not to acknowledge anymore in Lestat's canon as his story continues and her ideas on the character change shape. You may have heard that she's currently working to develop the Vampire Chronicles into a primetime TV series in the epic serial style a la Game of Thrones, and rumor has it, season one is going to start with this book. Despite all the characters gone through and the vast array of critical opinion on the Chronicles, this book stands firm. And as we've discussed in my previous videos, there is no denying the importance of Lestat in the grand scheme of vampire media and the impact he's had on the pop culture development of the vampire since this. Lestat doesn't know if his philosophies on existence, his understanding of goodness is true. His ego's not that great and his mind is always open. He just knows that the beliefs are his and he is thoroughly individual and knows no other way to be. I never have listened to anyone really, he says. 
Somehow or other, I never can. He endures on the strength of his pure, shameless individuality. And that's why he's so popular. The very essence of the vampire that... What? Already? Again? Okay, apparently I've reached my time limit for how much I'm allowed to talk about Lestat per hour. Even though I've barely even given you a taste of what the vampire means in this book, or does it mean nothing at all? Does nothing mean anything? Does any of that matter? But you know, even as a reflection of humanity, the fact that the vampire indulges in such existential quandaries is indicative of a certain level of privilege. Many people with less privilege don't have the time or freedom for such contemplations amid the hard-working business of their daily lives. But is such freedom truly a privilege? Or ought it be an inalienable human right? An inalienable vampire right? Or... Okay, okay, fine. You know what? Just add this book to your essential vampire reading list. I will expect your essays on my coffin by Thursday. I'm the maven of the eventide, and... I keep showing you this copy of my book, but this is just my fancy display copy. But here's the copy of the book that I actually use. Yes, it is held together by tape. Look what I got! It's my novel! The one I wrote! The one that's about vampires and personified death and the apocalypse, and you can have it too. It's available. This is the hardback. There's also paperback. There's also a Kindle book. You can find it on Amazon, or you can get these copies anywhere that you buy books online. The Company of Death by me, Elisa Hansen. It's my book, and it can be yours too. Thank you to my Patreon patrons for supporting my videos. If you would like to help me make more vampire reviews and write more books, consider joining my Patreon. You guys are amazing. I love you. Good night. It's so pretty. Look, it's me.